Hey, everyone. Uh, if you've been a marketer for any length of time, you no doubt have come across Anne Handley's work. Uh, she's a Wall Street Journal best-selling author, uh, high demand, uh, a keynote speaker at multiple events, uh, and most probably the most uh, recognized as chief content officer at Marketing Profs. Um, in this special episode we recorded during our Revenue Rockstar series, Anne had joined our very own Tara Benyuski to share what's shaping the landscape of content marketing today and what's working, what's not working, and then the best ways to pitch content marketing internally to those who are needing to get budget approved. Uh, Anne really never fails to entertain and inform in this session, and the, uh, this one is no exception. So uh, get ready to take lots of notes. Uh, so let's get into it. From Ian's perspective, how do you see writing and content fitting into this overall mix of revenue-minded webinars? Yeah, I think that the focus on revenue is is really important here because I think if there's one thing that we've seen over the past 18 months or so um, is the importance of content, not just top of funnel, right? Not just as a way to attract customers or prospects to us, but also a way to, to nurture them, to convert them, to think about building relationships post sale as well. So I think, you know, what we're seeing really is content growing up. It's no longer just top of funnel. It's no longer siloed. It's really increasingly being um, integrated throughout the, the sales and marketing function, which to me is, is just, um, you know, it's kind of about time. And, but I think it's, it's a really watershed moment for, for marketing and sales. And it may seem, oh, this has been a slow evolution, but I think we've really seen it accelerate over the past 18 months when we've all been, you know, interacting through digital channels. One of the things that I think is really interesting. So marketing props every year does a content marketing survey with the content marketing Institute every year we partner on it. And this is our 12th year of producing this joint content marketing study. And the most recent study just came out six or seven days ago, something like that. Um, and some of the findings in it were really interesting and they really underscore what you're talking about, Tara, which is that content is definitely throughout everything that we do now. It's really seeded and woven into almost everything that we do. One of the interesting questions uh, that we asked B2B marketers was, what do you expect will happen with your budgets, right? Because Money talks, you know, you follow the money when, and if there's money going towards something, then that means there's some momentum behind it too, right? And so we asked B2B marketers, how will your budget change in 2022? So looking forward compared with this year, right? Compared with 2021. And these results just astounded me because taken together, 20% of B2B marketers think that they will increase their budget more than 9%. And 46% of B2B marketers of us think that we'll increase it between one and 9%. So taken together, 66% of us are looking to put more money into the content that we're producing. And I think that's a really interesting stat, right? Because it really speaks to the importance of content, you know, throughout the entire marketing and sales function in a, in a very tangible way. And there's a, a few, just anecdotally too, I just wanted to share a few quotes. So we asked what is going on in, in like a, a more general state of, of, of content marketing within your own organization as it relates to the pandemic, as it relates to the past 18 months. And these are some direct quotes from people who took the survey. <laughs> we said, yo, marketing. This is exactly how we speak to marketers because we're buttoned up and professional like this. We say, yo, marketing, what's your content look like post COVID? And one person said, who would have thought that a pandemic would be the thing to finally bring content marketing out from behind the shadows and into the forefront of marketing communication. And really we're seeing that. We're seeing it not just evolve from the shadows, but really take a center stage role in both marketing and sales as the primary tool that we use to communicate with people who matter to our business. And then the second quote here from another person, the pandemic reinforced the importance of our content, stra content marketing strategy. There had been a commitment to it, but now that commitment is company wide and there's more collaboration between marketing and sales and like high five, right? That's fantastic right there. That's the moment we've been waiting for. So when I say it's a watershed moment, I really do believe this. And I think that the data and the anecdotes bear that up. No two buyers are the same, right? They have 
um, slightly different needs. They may have different profiles, different challenges that they're, they might be facing. So having one linear path really just doesn't really push mm-hmm. out with how real people buy today. And whether you call it linear, whether you call it a looped buying cycle, like you have to have the content ready for them in the moment that it really fits their needs. And having the educational content to the convincing content to helping people actually make the decision and have what they need is so helpful for a smooth experience. Yeah, exactly. And that word experience, what does it look like throughout the sales cycle? Again, pre-sale and and post-sale, like throughout the entire customer lifestyle, throughout the entire relationship. Two more quick stats that I want to share with the most successful content marketers, B2B content marketers, craft content based on specific stages of the buyer journey, right? So 62% are doing that, right? But just 17% of the least successful are doing that. So, you know, what does that mean? It means that, you know, those of us who are actually thinking about content, like you said, Tara, throughout the, the sales and marketing function, right, are, are, are more successfully um, using that content, right? So the most successful content marketers are thinking about not just top of funnel, but throughout the entire ecosystem. So I wanted to share this one with you. And one more on the topic of content and research. I always love every single year, as I said, we've been doing this for 12 years. And I always love to hear what are the the kinds of assets that you are finding most success with. And of course, that's changed over time as video and as live streaming and as, as some of the social platforms have really evolved. And so I'm always interested in this because it feels like it it evolves right along with our culture and, and right along with marketing too. So we asked folks, what are you finding most success with? Number one here, virtual events and webinars. It's like an of course, right? Research reports, this one actually surprised me, 48%, so second most popular. Third most popular is blog posts of less than a thousand words, then case studies, videos, and long articles of more than 3,000 words at 32%. But I think it's interesting to see what we're having success with, what we're producing as, as you know, part of marketing and, and sales. But what I also think is interesting about this is that this is clearly not all top of funnel, right? Exactly. It's, it's throughout all that we're doing. And so yet more tangible evidence that I think that marketing and content is evolving in how we're perceived within the organization and and how we're leveraging it throughout the marketing and sales. So some of that very expected, but some of those definitely unexpected. So that's really interesting. You work with marketers every day. You work with folks uh, in every kind of business. When you are engaging um, with them, what are the things you tell writers who might be looking to renew their focus? Because we all get in these ruts from time to time or those who are looking to feel re-energized again. Yeah, and I'm like tempted to give writing advice here because I'm always full of, of writing advice, but I guess I want to pull it back a little bit and just speak at a little bit more of a higher level with maybe a little bit of a broader context. Because when I think about how should we be writing to, to drive revenue and, and to engage with our prospects and with our customers, I'm getting distracted by comments. <laughs> oh, dang it. I'm trying not to. I can't get distracted. So when we think about like how we, how we should be writing, I think the most important thing is to to do a sort of level set with yourself, right? Um, it's almost like a mindset shift. And the thing to think about is that when your customers or your, well, really when your prospects come to your website, to your social channels, almost anything that you publish or produce, they're thinking about three different things, right? They're thinking about do I see myself reflected in your words and, and in your copy and also in your images, which is, you know, kind of outside of the question you asked, but I think are also, is also really important. So do I see myself? And then secondly, do I trust you? Like everything that you're producing, can, does it seem like you're the good, the best fit for me? Can I trust that you will be there? Not just now that you know what you're talking about, but maybe post-sale if and, and when there's a problem and there's always a problem of, of some kind or another, right? And so do I see myself? Do I trust you? And the third thing is, do I like you? And I think that affinity piece, are we projecting affinity for our audience? Like, are we saying like, here's who we are and here's what we're all about? And, you know, we, it, do I like you? I think that's another important piece. And if you think about those three things, I think when you sit down to 
craft anything that, that you publish or produce on behalf of a brand. I think it just really helps you understand like how you should be showing up for the people that, that matter to you and, and your business. So that's how I think about it. Again, very high level. Every time I sit down to write, whether it's a blog post or my email newsletter or a social post, it doesn't matter. Like, that's what's in my head. Am I showing people who I am in a very real and visceral way? And also, do they see themselves in, in what I'm producing? And, and can they trust that I, that I am who I say that I am and that I will be there over time? And the trust isn't something that, of course, you're going to build through one social post or one newsletter or whatever. But I think if you can keep that in your head, that trust is built over time and we need to be consistently demonstrating that. I think that's the key. And, and those three things, I think, are the foundation of anything that, you, that you're writing. Do you think that it matters how the channel or the medium, let's say we, we have email at hand, we have digital ads, we have white papers, blogs, websites, mm -hmm. does it matter the medium or the channel, or would you say that applies consistently? Yeah, I do think it, it applies consistently. Sometimes when we start talking about tactics, and, and even when I share something like this, I almost want to add like an asterisk next to it and say, you don't have to do all of this, right? You just need to find the one thing that you can do consistently. Start there and do that super well and then build on it over time. Add a second one if you have the resources and the time and if your customers are there and if it's a, a valuable channel for you. And so, yes, I do think that it doesn't really matter what channel, but also like you don't have to be, you don't have to be everywhere and doing everything. I think really focusing, saying no is just as important in marketing as saying yes. And I think the point where you can really focus in on one thing and do it super well, you're ultimately, you'll be that much further ahead as opposed to doing a bunch of stuff in a mediocre way. Yeah. And I just want to take just a minute or two and tell the story about what, what Marnie Oaks Raleigh did. You're going to probably hear this from her as well. And Maybe she, she, she can correct anything that I got completely wrong. But, but so Marty Oaks Raleigh runs an agency in the Minneapolis St. Paul area. They are a small agency. She told me this morning that they have 13 people working for her, uh, working for them. And they wanted to rebrand, like they wanted to rethink how they were showing up in the market. Things had shifted within their own company. Their business had shifted and how they were showing up. They wanted to reflect, the, they, wanted th they wanted to reflect it in a slightly um, different way. And so they went through this entire half year branding, uh, rebranding, got super into it, looked at every single asset on the web website, redid their customer journey, just rethought everything from the logo to the tone of voice, to the kinds of assets they're, they're producing to their content. And there's a few things that I just want to highlight because I think that she and her team did such a fantastic job with it. Here is an email that I got from Marnie because I am on her email list. And she's highlighting the fact that, yay, like she's announcing we have rebranded in the email newsletter and underneath it, she's talking about why they rebranded. But I wanted to call out this email newsletter in particular because Email newsletters, like if your email newsletter is not fantastic, throw on all the other things you're doing and just focus on your email newsletter because I think it's such an undervalued asset for so many of us. So make your email newsletter really great before you start focusing on anything else, number one. And I think that Marnie did a, a really good job with this. And I want to call out one thing in particular. It comes from Marnie, right? Oh, and Don's here too. <laughs> hi, hi, Don. It comes from Marnie, like it's Marnie at Evolve Systems. It doesn't come from newsletter at Evolve Systems or Evolve Systems at Evolve Systems. I love the fact that it comes from a person. Her face is right there on my Gmail. And I just love the fact that it's truly, it's, it feels very human. And automatically, even if you don't read the rest of the newsletter, that automatically sets a very human and accessible tone. So I, I love that quite a bit. Yeah, that's perfect. And I recently talked to Marty myself and she even rebranded her title to customer champion or client champion. So it is definitely rebranded through and through. Yeah. And I just want to call out a, a few other things that they did. And one specific thing that I think is also super smart, Evolve Systems is a very small team. And so they took this, their, this rebranding that they did as, as almost a team building exercise, super smart. And they also used it as a, a content exercise because if you have 13 people on your team and you're all like focused on this rebranding, like what happens to the business, right? What happens to your marketing? And so what they ended up doing was using this rebranding program that they went through, this rebranding 
idea and using it as a way to generate more content. So they're showing, showing their work, so to speak. Like when you're in school and your math teacher always wanted you to like show the work when you were like doing your problems. This is exactly what they did from a content and business standpoint, a case study that they put together showing, you know, how they went across it, how they went uh, through their rebranding and how they approached it. And then they took all of the lessons that they learned and turned it into a content asset that they could then use to market the business to help the people that they market to manufacturing companies. It's a free rebranding checklist. Does your business need a rebrand? So it's a fantastic way, I think, of taking what you're doing in your business and showing your work, right? Showing your work in a way that will help others that you seek to attract. So yeah, really well done, <laughs> Marnie and team. Everybody, I'm saying Marnie, but she's one of, of many people. They're a fantastic group of people and they were all part of this. Certainly are. Speaking of the business, and it goes beyond just the, the marketing function. Now, and you touched on this earlier, and content mm -hmm. plays such a starring role in so much of what we do across the entire business. It's so central to everything. We don't always even think about it, but mm -hmm. from creating that brand awareness and personality to educating the market, both the indirect and the direct value of a product or the service that we offer, and then all the way ultimately to convincing and converting audience to actually become a paying customer. Mm -hmm. you know, how do we as marketers champing the role of content how do we amplify the value of content, not just for our clients, but also internally? Like, how do we evangelize the value? I think that Evolve Systems and Marty and Don and the team, there are a great example of that, of truly evangelizing the role of content internally, letting people know, hey, this is super important that we rethink how we're producing content, how we're rethinking the customer journey. So that's one way of evangelizing the idea internally and getting everybody on the same page. But I also wanted to share another example from another agency who I think does this super well. My friend Ahava Liebtag runs an agency outside of Washington, D.C. called Aha Media. And what they decided to do at the very beginning of, of this year in, in January was they ungated all of their content on their website. They just took all the roadblocks down. So you didn't have to offer your email address to sign up to download any of their reports. Now, why would they do this? They had a few things in mind. The first thing was they were hoping to increase the number of shares for their content, right? So they were hoping to get their brand shared more, more freely on social media. So they thought, okay, if we take down the roadblock, people would be more likely to share. The second reason was they wanted to build trust with the people that they sell to. Now, who does AHA Media Group sell to? And that headline gives you a little hint right there. They sell to hospitals and healthcare marketers. Obviously, for the past 18 months, hospitals, healthcare marketers have been under tremendous pressure, right? Things have really changed in all of our worlds, but especially in healthcare marketers, which is, have really been ground zero for this, for this pandemic that we're still in, right? And so to them, they thought, okay, we're going to build, we want to build trust with these people. The best way to do that is maybe just to ungate all of our content, offer, offer all of our resources to free. They're a content marketing agency, they sell to hospitals. Let's just offer it all for free because these people need us right now. And so that's exactly what they did. It was a little bit of an experiment. They didn't know how this was gonna go, but let's, sh let's show the next, uh, the next slide here. And it's fantastic. It turned out to be an incredible success. AHA Media Group downloads increased by 102%, of course, because you don't have to put your email address in, but still, that number is pretty astounding. 102% is pretty intense. But more than that, there were all there was tons of other things that happened as a result. Website traffic was up 48%. The number of email newsletter signups that they got was up 14%. What other stats? I'm trying to remember. Oh, social media. Their social media audience grew by over 40% as well. So their footprint grew much larger. And also the trust that they built with their audience has never been stronger. AHA Media Group has had a fantastic year in part because they're making strategic decisions that work for them. Now, I'm not saying that everybody here that you should ungate all of your content. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying it worked for them because of their specific audience that they sell to and because they approached it in a very smart and strategic way. But I'm sharing it as an example of evangelizing the importance in the role of content externally as well. So Marnie and her group are a great example internally, but I think AHA Media Group is a great example externally. Yeah, I would have to agree. I think too, as marketers, we start to shift towards so many things that we can measure. And yeah. so 
being able to measure when someone actually puts their email address in or download something, it feels very concrete and measurable. But in reality, some of that, you're causing friction in the, the buying process, right? Because as people need information, they may not be ready to commit to giving the, your e their email address. And so I think really just understanding what you should make available as opposed to holding back for later is so key. By eating everything, it makes it a little bit more difficult for folks to get the information as they need it. Yeah. Yeah. And I also think that something like this is it's, it runs counter to what most B2B marketers do. And that's in part why this was so successful, right? Because they, they upended the status quo. Instead of saying everybody offers a download with a, with an email address. Instead of that, they said, what if we didn't? So I like the way that they thought out of the box a little bit, and they thought they were a little bit counterintuitive with it. What if we didn't do that? What would happen? And, and I also like something else about it, that AHA Media Group was super upfront about the fact that this was an experiment and they didn't know how it was going to go. And it may be a flop. It may be a disaster. And if so, then they're going to regate everything all over again. Like they were very upfront about that. And I think that level of transparency and honesty is really authentic. And that also goes a long way to building that trust with your audience. I definitely would agree with that. And you mentioned something else too, a little bit ago, how the Evolve team rebranded for the external go-to-market, but also internally as a team. Yeah. And I think by doing that organically, the results and that they were seeing were so much more powerful as opposed to trying to, you know, force everyone internally to message and to create content along their new brand. It, it almost it was as if it organically, you know, was exuding from them. I'm glad you brought that up because I do think it's it's really important. It's really a way to align everybody and to get everybody rowing in the same direction, to use a cliche, but it's 100% true. Getting everybody together and saying, here's what we're all about, here's our mission, here's our vision, and here's the kind of content that we want to produce for our audience. Like, this is what gets us up in the morning and these are the people we sell to. So I think just articulating that and getting everybody involved in a rebranding effort is just, it's, it's so powerful. And you probably don't need to do a large scale rebranding effort, right? This could be, it could be much smaller scale. You could decide just to do, I don't know, to like to launch a new product marketing campaign or something like that. I don't think it needs to be something as massive as a, as a rebranding of an entire, but I think looking for those moments and those opportunities to, to get everybody on the same page, I think is, is so smart about how, how Marty did it. <laughs> <laughs> so you had mentioned several times authenticity, and I think we all toss that word around authenticity and get beyond the fluff. For example, you place a ton of value on humor. You've been known to say that people absorb information way better when they're having fun. So talk to us about what does authenticity mean and what, how does that actually play out when you develop content? Oh, I feel like this is like the hardest question ever. It's, uh, honestly, I, I it, part of me feels allergic to that word authenticity, at least in marketing, because it, it feels like something that you put on. Like I put on this suit jacket. It feels, oh, I'm, look, at, I'm authentic now. I'm like really authentic. But it's not like that. It's basically how you walk the walk and it's how you show up. It's you showing your audience who you are. We started this conversation where you asked me, what are the three things you need to think about when you're sitting down to write or to create any kind of content for your audience? And it's, it's do I see me? Do I trust you? And do I like you? And I think that's really where, where authenticity lives. That's where it comes from. I think it's hard to manufacture authenticity because literally you can't, right? It has to come from you. It has to come from your brand and the people who are a part of your brand. That's where it lives. And, uh, and yeah, so I guess that's where it comes from. I do think it's, it's very important to think about being accessible as well. And another A word in content marketing. Um, and that's where, that's why I like humor so much because I think humor can signal belonging. It can signal that we get you it can bridge that connection of likability and accessibility. So yeah, that's another reason why I, I like humor a lot. And I, I like the way that if you can, because humor is so subjective, right? That if you can make your audience laugh, or if you can actually s signal in a way that we know that you will think this is funny, that's a very powerful moment. It's a very powerful thing to do. For sure. And yeah, and just goes back to the whole human side of we're at the end of the day, we're communicating through content and messaging mm -hmm. to real people. So let's shift a little bit. So with storytelling, we hear so much about storytelling these days as well. Mm -hmm. um, 
marketers have been charged with articulating their brand story. You know, according mm -hmm. to stats, even stories are remembered up to 22 times more than facts alone. Given customer personable, relatable connection to a brand, yeah. they're the empathetic yeah. bridge in ways. And the bottom line is people like to work with people they like to talk with in how businesses sell their businesses. So talk a bit about, you know, storytelling and the value. But yeah, I feel like that stat that you shared, like what people remember stories 22% more than they remember facts. I feel like we should have a story around that. We should have, we should, we should have a stage a one act play right now to demonstrate that because of course it's true. Like you can remember stories to a far greater degree than you can remember facts or stats or anything that is bloodless, so to speak. So yeah, when I think about the storytelling as relates to to marketing. And honestly, Tara, like we could focus on storytelling for this entire session. This fall, the the keynote that I'm giving most frequently is about storytelling and marketing and how do we actually tell true stories and with an, an artfulness, but also with keeping in mind, just like the fact that we're using them to, to connect with customers and get them involved in what we do or what we sell. I think that the most important thing is to think about the human at the center of your story. And we hear this all the time that make the customer the hero of your story. But what does that actually mean? It means what you do or what you sell is not your story, right? Your story is not your product. Your story is what your product or your service does for the person who matters to you. And Find the person that you help, essentially. Find the person and tell their story. And that will resonate more than 22 times, more than anything else that you publish or produce as a, from marketing. I think it's important to think about what you do for the customers. And honestly, just going back to the, the stats for a second here, like about what we're doing as marketers and what's been so successful. I think that's why case studies here are, are like consistently in the past 12 years, they show up in one of the top five or six assets. And why is that? It's because they tell the story of how our product lives in the world. There's an art to doing it well, but I think start with the human and or humans who, who you're helping and find that person and tell that. So we're talking a lot about making your content enjoyable and thinking about being truly customer centric. I wanted to share just maybe one final example and it, to tell the story of another agency. This is an agency called Carney and Company and they are based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And what I love about what, what Carney and company does is that they publish a daily newsletter about marketing information called the daily carnage. Um, and it's a newsletter that shows up every single morning in my inbox. It gives me all kinds of ideas and, and tactics and strategies around marketing. But what I especially love is that yes, the newsletter is fantastic, but then they also have a Facebook group called the daily carnage Facebook group. And I think that this is really significant because remember the name of the agency is Carney and Company, but the name of the Facebook group is The Daily Carnage. It's literally named after the newsletter. And to me, like this is just, it's, it was such a brilliant way, I think, of reframing your content as community. So The Daily Carnage is a Facebook group in which people can ask questions. If you've got a, a question about marketing, all kinds of things, like all kinds of conversations going on there. And look at that, it has 17,000 members. But what I really love is that this feeds the newsletter, right? So every Friday they do a Facebook Friday and they call out uh, questions that have gotten tons of traction in the Facebook group itself. And they also, by the way, use it to amplify the newsletter, what's going on in the newsletter. So it becomes like this content ecosystem just all on its own taking one thing and using it to build community off of one content asset and using it to fuel another content asset, which then fuels the original content asset. It's just beautiful. So yeah, so that's what I, I just, I wanted to share that example because I think it's a great example of a small company, by the way, another small company doing really fantastic work. And ultimately really, it, it allows them to punch above their weight class, so to speak. It allows them to show up in a more significant, impactful way. Even though this, this agency is small B2B agency based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Any thoughts on how to produce quality, consistent content at scale with very limited resources? <laughs> I feel like I just answered that question with, with my Cardi example. I love that question because I think that's the challenge that we all have as, as B2B marketers. I have literally never met a marketer who has worked at even a massive enterprise organization in, who has said, I have all the resources I need. I have all like cash money to do whatever I want. Like that doesn't exist. That person does not exist. 
And so I think we all are struggling with limited resources. And, and if you're small, you, maybe you can even throw three berries before limited resources. So maybe it is very limited resources. I think the most important thing to do, if I were, I were you, I would focus on that email newsletter. Like I said, because in my mind, the email newsletter is, is the one asset that you 100% own. You are not dependent on algorithms to, to try to break through. You own that list, you can produce it at scale. I would focus on that. And that's what's going to ultimately allow you to build a relationship with one person at one time. So in terms of where I would start my content, that's what I would focus on. And that's what I would do. Okay. And this next question is not going to come as any surprise, but Ann, what's the best way for folks to get uh, more content? (laughs) (laughs) I publish my own email newsletter every other week at, you can subscribe at annhaley.com slash newsletter. It's the best thing on the internet. I don't know. I'm just going to claim that. Why not? It's, no, it's, I publish it every other week. It's different than the marketing cross newsletter, which comes out three times a week and shares lots of tips and tactics and ideas for B2B marketing. My newsletter focuses on content and writing and on communicating in all the things we're talking about today, communicating in human, authentic, story-driven ways. That's great. And it's the time flu is really great information coming at us <laughs> fast and a lot of takeaways, I think, from here. Just you know, really, as you're looking to you know, individually shape your strategies, especially going into 2022, like it, what you're going to do next year is probably prominent for many folks. So I think just having this information, being able to digest it and then think about how it applies for your business going forward has been, it's just been a lot of fun to get that information from you and always a pleasure. Thank you so much, Tara and Sharp Spring. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for spending time with us today on behalf of Ann and, and Sharp Spring.